yeah hello good evening and welcome you all for today's lecture actually everybody can uh, unmute yourself today if there is a disturbance uh, we have to mute you all but anyway we uh, make sure that everybody is uh, muted while the lecture is uh, going on thank you and as usual i am here today i am also kamala gunawardena fellow representative of this uh, council and which are sharing this knowledge sharing subcommittee of civil engineering sectional committee our today's webinar is, uh, is again a continuation of medium rise buildings and constructions by our professor jai singh and this is the seventh lecture for the whole series you all are now very familiar about the activities of civil engineering sectional committee and your participation was really remarkable in the previous lectures and other webinars also so that itself an appreciation of our work and we appreciate your return as well right uh, so everybody i'm um, we are starting the today's event right now and it is actually it is an honor for me to make this instigating not even though you all are known this uh, speaker today he's always with a bag of full stuff in his area and that is how he has taken this challenge of giving you this best knowledge about the title so i will call over uh, again professor tisanjay singh a senior professor of civil engineering at the university of morotua uh, this uh, his topic today is structural forms for tall buildings is uh, he will explain you how the lateral forces can dominate the selection of appropriate lateral load resistance system together with various structural forms and systems that can be successfully adopted for tall buildings of different heights i wish to remind you to join tomorrow we have a webinar before i before i invite uh, professor again mm -hmm. uh, how environmental and social destruction caused by umaoya multi purpose development project was awarded is a question is organized by the water forum jointly with our civil engineering sectional committee tomorrow's present is uh, engineer dr jagat gunatilaka and we have day after tomorrow design of box structures on expressways and highways by engineer asel sumani singh now you all know who is the presenter for day after tomorrow also so without a further ado i call professor jayasekar to take over Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Engineer Kamala. Thank you, Engineer Kamala. In addition to that, uh, there's another lecture tomorrow at uh, I think I uh, fifteen. Uh, there's one uh, lecture on agricultural uh, agricultural sectional committee, and I am the speaker. I'm going to speak on modern organic farming that I based on all the work that I have done on uh, organic farming sector. Uh, i have actually spent a lot of my money to promote organic farming and uh, we have a lot of experience gained with so many things so we thought of actually uh, sharing all the knowledge that we have gathered so tomorrow there is another lecture on organic farming as well modern we call it modern modern organic farm farming which is very different to the kind of organic farming that is uh, advocated by the agriculture uh, department and ministry of agriculture they are all talking about organic farming but if you participate in tomorrow's lecture you will find what we call modern organic farm is very different to what is actually advocated by uh, the ministry of agriculture so today you know we are going to talk about structural forms for tall buildings and you all know tall buildings can be constructed to meet various needs like office space residential space commercial space and sometimes you know you get very tall buildings where you are going to combine so many different things and uh, so basically you have to resist gravitational loads the vertical loads and lateral loads and uh, some of these uh, loads are permanent nature like the self weight whereas others are variable so in uh, euro codes we get uh, permanent loads and variable loads and uh, so basically you have to ensure that there is adequate ultimate limit state 
so that ultimately we state strength so that you know overall you will have a factor of safety of at least two and most of the concrete structures will have a factor of safety of 2.5 in the range of 2.5 but one of the very important things you have to keep in mind is when you are dealing with tall buildings any structure like transfer plates which are which can be categorized as key elements key element is one where the failure can cause a significant collapse of the building you must not go for this kind of very low factor of safety like 2.5 you must go for much higher factor of safety like 4 or 4.5 the reason is the moment the factor of safety is higher the crack widths will be very small the moment the crack widths are very small what you find is the uh, the durability of reinforcement will be much higher so it's very important that you keep in mind uh, what the uh, philosophy call risk based design that means you know you as assume that different elements can have different risks when it comes to fail for example if you take a beam the beam does not fail at the support but it can easily fail in the span so you will have you need to have a higher factor of safety in the span than the support because support the maximum that can happen is there will be a plastic hinge forming at the support and that plastic hinge will allow some rotation in the beam with that rotation the more moment will be transferred to the span so if the if a failure occurs it will be in the span not in the span. so that's why we allow moment redistribution when you are designing knowing very well a beam will never ever fail at a support but it will always fail in the span so when you are designing a beam if it is an important one in my case i would have little bit of additional reinforcement so similarly you would have you would have heard about this uh, the collapse of a building in miami uh, in america in uh, florida and in that building it looks like they have not considered the construction sequence effect when they were uh, designing the building and because of that they have under designed the transfer plate by a small margin but this kind of uh, small margins can cause slightly higher crack widths and with a slightly higher crack width you will find the whole structure is okay except the transfer plate because transfer plate has undergone a higher degree of uh, deterioration than the rest of the building so when you are inspecting you inspect the the whole building it's, it's all fine then you might not suspect anything wrong with the transfer plate because the deflections are so small very difficult to see the deflections then one day transfer plate fails because it is capac its capacity is exceeded the reason is initially it has been under designed and then you find packets are more then gradually the factor of safety will reduce with time as the reinforcement deteriorates and one day the factor of safety can become less than one that day a disaster can happen so you have to always keep in mind when you are dealing with large structures never ever design based on codes you must have your own rules and one of the rules is always look at the member you are designing and z where it can fail the location it can fail ensure you have some extra factor of safety and at the locations it can never fail just have the marginal design so that you have the normal factor of safety and don't over design locations that can never ever fail but always think of having little extra capacity at the places where the structure can fail so always keep this in mind the moment you keep this in mind your designs will become very safe designs while they are economical because you are removing all the steel from places where failure cannot occur and you are adding some steel at places where failure cannot for example if i am designing a two way slab i will minimize the reinforcement everywhere except one place and that place is 
the short span direction in the span. In the span, I will consider long span as not critical. So I will use the minimum reinforcement I can have, but in the short direction, it can fail. So because of that, shorter span direction, I will be a little jealous. Every else, I will try and minimize as much as possible. And you know, these days, there's a huge supply chain uh, management issue caused by COVID related restrictions. And many parts of the world, supply chains have collapsed. And it will, it might take five, six months before the supply chains become, uh, come to the normal level. Until such time, many parts of the world will have huge shortage of materials. It's not, it's had nothing to do with the dollar shortage in Sri Lanka because it's a worldwide supply chain issue. And because of that reason, you'll find that the many goods will be very expensive short term. But uh, the chances are the prices will come down as the supply chain issues are sorted out. And today, if you are doing a design, you have to always keep it in mind. Steel is very expensive and Per ton cost can vary between 250,000, 350,000 to 370,000, or it can go even higher, depending on whether you can buy steel freely or whether you have to buy it in black market. So these are all happening, and it's the same with cement. And yesterday it was told 35 cement importing companies have withdrawn. So that is the reason for huge shortage of cement. So likewise, everywhere you find shortages, and that is, and these shortages will make some of these construction materials very expensive short term. So we have to always look for ordinary systems. And that's why, you know, I'm uh, doing another lecture on third of the, on the, on the first uh, Wednesday of uh, March, I'm planning to do a design on carbon zero buildings. And in that, uh, I'm going to uh, make a presentation on carbon zero buildings. And in that one, I'm going to show you how to construct without using concrete or minimum with minimum use of concrete, when it, but still constructing multi-story structures, like three to four story structures with minimum use of concrete, but with some use of cement. And I'm going to show you how to make structures almost carbon zero when it comes to the carbon footprint, because these structures would be much, the, much more thermally comfortable than normal structures. And, uh, and the, the embodied energy would be at a very low level. So because of that reason, you'll find uh, these structures are very, uh, uh, very, environmentally friendly structures or green structures or sustainable uh, the buildings with sustainable principles. So, so there are so many different things that are around us and this is a challenging time. So even when you are designing a tall building, you have to be mindful about it. We should not think we are going to have enormous amount of material, unlimited supply of material. We are going to, we must, try and make them as uh, optimum as possible. So when it comes to optimum structures, again, we have to think of normal reinforced concrete structures where say 50 to 60% of concrete is not doing anything. For example, in a slab, we have hogging moments and sagging moments in every section. Whatever the moment, below the neutral axis, the slab is cracked. So when you have a 150 millimeter thick slab in a structure, only 20 millimeters or 30 millimeters will be above the neutral axis. The remaining 120 millimeters will be below the neutral axis. So this concrete of 120 millimeter thickness is just adding weight, except providing cover to reinforcement. Then there are two penalties here. One penalty is, you are using this uh, reinforcement for two reasons. One is to carry flexure. What is the other reason? Other reason is to prevent 
the shrinkage and thermal cracks in concrete. So if you can have a system where you are going to remove all these cracked concrete, that means you are going to remove most of the concrete in the tension zone, then you can have a very economical structure. And so I'm going to talk about all these different things under slabs. We'll have a, a very detailed lecture on slabs in buildings, slabs in tall buildings. Because the reason is in a tall building, we have one element that will be repeated 50 times in a 50 story building. What is that element? That is a slab. You are going to repeat the slab. We design one slab. You are going to repeat it 50 times in the same. So if you can make a 10 millimeter reduction in the thickness, when you repeat it 50 times, you are going to make a reduction of 500 millimeters of concrete or the, the concrete that is sufficient for three more floors. So it's even the minute savings are so important. So that's why we say in tall buildings, don't change in 25 millimeter intervals, change in 10 millimeter intervals. So the slab can be 140 millimeter, 150 millimeter, 160 millimeter, 170 millimeter, 180 millimeter, 190 millimeter, or 200. Don't change the slab thickness in 25 millimeter intervals because in a tall building, even such a change may be too much. The reason is we are we have, we need very much optimized structures. If you save one ton per per slab, then you are going to save fifty tons in a fifty story. It may not be it may not sound big, but the moment you start saving like this, you might not save one ton. You might save several tons per flow, and these several tons will finally add to huge amount of extra expense. That can that is unnecessary. Then you'll ask why. The reason is slabs never ever fail in a building. Then you'll ask why. Why slabs do not fail in a building? Slabs do not fail in a building because the buildings are large and slabs of sufficient thickness can develop what we call arching action, because our beams are not going to deform because they are strong beams. So when the slab tries to deflect, it can develop what we call arching action. And because of arching action, the slabs will be a little more stronger than what you actually anticipate. And because of that reason, it's very hard for a slab to fail, provided that you have compacted the concrete well, you have cured the concrete well, and also you have used reasonably good quality concrete, and especially concrete containing at least 10 to 15 percent fly ash. Then you'll ask why. Again, you have to keep in mind when you have fly ash, the chloride resistance of concrete will be high. When you have fly ash, chloride resistance of concrete will be high. When you have fly ash, the workability of concrete will be high. When you have fry ash, the carbon footprint of concrete will be lower. That is advantageous. And then when you have fry ash, the most importantly, the concrete is going to gain strength over a longer period of time. It is not going to stop gaining strength in the first 10 days because when you look at the cement composition these days, cement composition has changed a lot. 50 years ago, when you take Cement. Cement has two main ingredients that can contribute to strength. In addition to the a very important ingredient, which is called uh, calcium aluminate, which will give the initial strength, which is only important only for the initial strength. But after that, there are two very important ingredients that can give strength. One is called tricalcium silicate. The other one is called dicalcium silicate. Tricalcium silicate gives the strength after 14 days. Sorry, tricalcium silicate gives the strength after one day, until four, up to 14 days. And dicalcium silicate gives strength from 14 days onwards. So if you take a cement, 
50 years old, then you will find those cements had 50% tricalcium silicate and 25% dicalcium silicate. So 50% tricalcium silicate will contribute to early strength from day one up to 14 days. And beyond 14 days, the strength gain will be lower, but because there are 25% dicalcium silicate, the concrete will continue to gain strength up to 20 days and even beyond. But today, if you look at cement, most of the cement contains 60 to 65% tricalcium silicate and only 5 to 10% dicalcium silicate. So what is the end result? Today, after three days, four days, you get enormous strength. After seven days, you can get 28 days strength. Then after 14 days, the strength gain is very slow, very slow. And you will find that 28 days strength is available in seven to 10 days. And you must know the reason. The reason is cement companies have done two things. Number one, they are adding more tricalcium silicate. Number two, they are grinding the cement finer so that you will end up with a higher strength, high early strength, but not very high long-term strength, long-term strength gains. And because of that reason, we like concretes made with fly ash. The moment you have fly ash, the, the byproduct of the uh, the hydration process, calcium hydroxide will start reacting with fly ash. And what is the end result? You are going to get a higher strength concrete and a concrete that is capable of gaining strength over a longer period of time. Even after 90 days, you will find still the strength is increasing slightly. Increasing slightly. So which is a better concrete? The concrete containing fly ash is much better because it has low carbon footprint, it has low embodied energy, it has, it has desirable properties, it, it is more chloride resistant, and it is also, uh, could be more sulfate resistant, and most importantly, fly ash containing concrete can be made slightly cheaper because fly ash can be uh, obtain almost uh, at a lower cost, much lower cost than one kilogram of cement. So in today's prices, uh, one kilogram of cement can vary between 30 to 40 rupees, whereas one kilogram of fry ash can be, should be available around 10 rupees because fry ash is, is a byproduct of our Norachole power plant so good quality fly ash should be available in Sri Lanka for less than 10 rupees a kilo. So now you can see, when you look at all these good properties, you make a good quality concrete using fly ash, good quality cement, and then you use super blast sizes, use less water, you can make dense concrete, flowable dense concrete, and then you'll end up with a good quality concrete in the slab. And you, if you have ensured 20 to 25 millimeter cover, all the steel in the slabs will be very safe. They will not undergo any deterioration. And with that, you can easily say, you only 20 millimeter cover, you can easily say, you have a slab, that is not going to fail easy. And if you look at the live load scenario, unless you go for storage, it's very hard to find enough furniture or people who are, who are, who are having sufficient weight to cause the kind of imposed loads that you have assumed in your structural design. So because of that reason, always keep in mind, steps are very safe. The only critical location in a slab is the short span. So if you are, if you want to be generous, be generous only there, other places, think of using not only 10 millimeter steel, even eight millimeter steel. And if you break a building, which is 50, 60 years old, 
then you will find they have even used six millimeter wires, six millimeter wires. But today it's not allowed, but you can easily use eight millimeters. But when you use eight millimeters, you have to have some timber planks on that steel mat because when you, if you walk on the steel mat, it can deform. So because of that reason, you need to have sufficient timber planks on the slab for walking until you complete the concreting. You need to have sufficient timber planks on the on the steel mat so that when you are walking, you will walk on the timber planks, not on the net. But if you have a 10 millimeter net, even if you walk on the net, nothing will happen. But if you are not having, if you are having eight millimeter wires or eight, eight millimeter reinforcement in the slabs, then you have to be a little careful during construction. And the other most important thing is always go for proper cow, block, cow blocks, which come with the binding wire so that the cow blocks will remain at the correct location during the concrete work. So these are very minute things, but very often engineers overlook this and then they say, slabs deteriorate. And nobody can understand why, how slabs can deteriorate because steps are one of the safest in the structure. And the moment you know steps are one of the safest in the structure, you can always think of uh, optimizing the steps so the, the vertical load can be minimized. And the advantage of minimizing the vertical load is very evident. When you, are, when you have end-bearing pipes, when you have end-bearing pipes, but if you have good soil, you have, uh, you have the skill friction in addition to end bearing, then you will find even if the dead weight of the structure is slightly higher, you are okay. But if you have very weak soils where you have to rely a lot on end bearing and the skin friction within the, within the bedrock, then you'll find minimizing the weight of the structure is also important. So, in a tall building, we have vertical loads, lateral loads. Lateral loads, we have no control, but vertical loads, we can control. We must try our best to minimize the, the vertical load by using reasonably high strength material. So if you can minimize the thickness of a slab by using 40 megapascal concrete, or 35 megapascal concrete rather than using 25 or 30 megapascal concrete. You should always look, look for these options and go for, try and use them, try and use them. And to all, do all these things, your construction quality assurance scheme should be very good at the site. Not only the project management part, but the quality assurance scheme should be very accurate at the site and you can't afford to have any leaks in the shutters. You can't afford to have a situation where you ignore curing of the steps. Because curing of the steps will be very important at least for seven days because, uh, because we are using high, you know, concrete with uh, cement with a lot of tricalcium silicate. So still curing the steps for at least seven days. And at least until the shuttering of the upper floor comes so that the lower floor becomes shaded. You have to do it because our climatic conditions are not conducive for cement to gain strength. You have to look after the concrete. So why I said all these things is, when I say structural form, it is not only the structural form for lateral resistance, but the vertical load carrying system. Optimization is also very important when it comes to tall buildings. I'm talking about the range of 40, 50, and then you can think of 60 to 70 and beyond 60 to 70, we generally call them super tall buildings. And uh, we are not going to touch a lot about super tall buildings at the moment. And we are planning to get another expert, uh, Dr. Damika Maharachi, who has already designed a 120 story tall building, uh, uh, sharing his expertise with you. And at the moment he's in Sri Lanka. 
and uh, I'll see whether he is willing to do a lecture. And if he's willing to do a lecture, we can even have an extra lecture one of these days just to hear what uh, hear or share his experience. But um, definitely he will come on this series and he will do some lectures. So if you look at the the situation, the situation is we have to have thorough knowledge about the lateral load resistance system. We, we need to have thorough knowledge about the vertical load resistance system. And we need to optimize both systems if we want to have an economical structure. And it is very important in today's context because we are having serious problems with supply chain management. So if you, when it comes to lateral deflection of a structure, the, the lateral deflection should be controlled to height of 500. And uh, sometimes we go for even height of 600, height of 700, but it's, uh, it's, it depends on how much you have optimized. But generally, it's important to control the lateral deflection to height of 500. The, 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 the relative drift between two consecutive flows also should be controlled very carefully. And height of 500 is, 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 uh, is a good indicator for that also. The reason is, if, uh, if the deflection between two flows is more than height of 500, then you might find the operation of the lift may be a little difficult because the lift has to go not in a vertical path, but in a curve. So lift, you'll find the, the wheels of the lift, which are, which are on the rails, will start making unnecessary noise because lift is not going in a vertical path, it's going in a curved path. So you have to be, you have to always check interstory drift. That means the drift between two consecutive flows must be checked in addition to the overall deflection of the building. The reason is in most of the buildings, I told, I showed you earlier in one of the lectures, the, the shear walls behave in cantilever mode, the frames can behave in the shear mode. So because of that reason, the cantilever mode dominates in, at the lower part of the building and the shear mode dominates in the upper part of the building. Because of that reason, the overall deflection can be less than what you get with cantilever mode. So in that, when you look at that, you can see in the middle part of the building, you can get the highest interstory drift, the drift between two consecutive flows. And you must look for that and ensure that it is less than height of So then, then I can again look into another matter. When you are talking about steel and concrete, steel was very popular in the earlier buildings. And if you look at Empire State Building, Empire State Building has steel, which is as much as twice if we design the Empire State Building today. Empire State Building was designed in 1920s, late 1920s. It was constructed during the Great Depression in America. And there's another very important structure that was uh, constructed during the Great Depression, and that is called the Hoover, Hoover, Dam, Hoover Dam. And uh, that actually created such a massive reservoir on on in America uh, and the construction of that reservoir dipped the, the whole, the, the, the crust, earth crust in that area by 60 millimeters. The, the weight of the water is so much, the earth crust dipped by 60 millimeters. And in Sri Lanka also, people talk about Earthquakes caused by Victoria Resort. And Victoria does not, cannot cause earthquakes because the quantity of water that we store in Victoria Dam is so small, it cannot cause much deformation in the earth crust. But whereas this particular huge dam in America has caused a big 
dip of 60 millimeters. Even then it's 60 millimeters. So you can see Victoria Dam can never ever cause any earthquakes in Sri Lanka. So has Scott Malay Dam and Randalikal Dam. But many people talk so much rubbish in this country and you'll find people are talking about earthquake zones, earthquake zones forming south of Sri Lanka. But that is in geological scale. You are talking about millions of years. It will take at least a few millions of years to form some kind of breaking up south of Sri Lanka. It will never ever happen in our lives. So always think that things happen in the earth in geological scale. When we talk about our buildings, we are talking about a lifespan of 100 to 500 years. Then you'll ask, why I talk about 500 years? That is because now you can see, if you look at the very early buildings in the world, most of those buildings are still standing in America. And if you look at Empire State Building, that 1931, now it's close to 90 years, still it's standing. So you can see the buildings should be designed for a longer period than 100 years. Although the code say 100 years is sufficient, now it has come to the level, we have to say 100 years is not sufficient. We should start looking at 500 years. And the only way we can look at 500 years is the moment you master the concrete technology and go for higher strength concrete. And higher strength concrete is achieved not by using too much cement, but by using other techniques, like controlling the water cement ratio, controlling uh, and adding fly ash so that the strength can, can gain over a longer period of time. And that's where the Eurocode comes to the scene. Eurocode allows us to use higher strength materials and strength of the cubes can go up to 105 megapascal in Europe. And the corresponding uh, Cylinder strength is about 90 megapascal. So, what is the difference between steel and concrete? What is the difference between steel and concrete? Can anybody answer? There's a huge difference between steel and concrete. The steel is very strong. It has an elastic modulus of 200 kilonewtons per millimeter square. Elastic modulus of 200 kilonewtons per millimeter square. Concrete is much weaker, but concrete is out of natural materials like the crushed stone, sand, all that we can find around us, plus some manufactured material again using the natural materials, and that is it. In addition to that, we can have byproducts like fly ash, we can also have silica film, and we can also control the water cement ratio significantly by adding a very advanced. Uh, so uh, advanced uh, admixtures and we are very fortunate that we have few companies who are manufacturing these chemicals in Sri Lanka and because of these companies today we have the ability to go up to 150 megapascal 150 megapascal that is beyond what we can achieve what is allowed in Europe. So you can see, if you are capable, if you are willing to take challenges, then you can go up to 150 megapascal in Sri Lanka, which is again allowed in, in practice, because if you want to do something beyond the strengths allowed in a code, then you have to link up with a good university and then do some research come up with rules, new rules, use them cautiously, and then go for, stretch the limits. And when you are going, doing, going for high, very tall buildings, super tall range, always you have to stretch the limits. Then I ask the question, what is the difference between steel and concrete? The, the, the concrete has a very important problem. When you control the water cement ratio, go for higher strengths, elastic modulus increases because the elastic modulus increases, when you go for higher and higher strength concretes, you get a super strong material. And when you are using high strength concrete, 
the main advantage is stiffness of the structure increases. The biggest drawback with steel is elastic modulus does not change. Even with high sensitivity, elastic modulus is still 200 kilonewtons per minute. Still, elastic modulus never changes, whereas concrete, as you improve the quality of concrete, go for higher strength concretes, the stiffness of the structure increases because elastic modulus increases. That's a very important thing that you have to keep in mind. And now you can see why all the super tall buildings that are designed today, concrete is becoming a very uh, important material. And that is the number one choice. Why? Because the modern codes of practice like ACI code and Euro codes, they all, all allow us to use high strength concrete and make the maximum use of higher elastic models. So don't think, don't jump to the idea of using 25 megapascal or 30 megapascal concrete saying, I'm going to design a reinforced concrete. Never do that. Well, let's think, what can I achieve if I try and go for high strength concrete? And with high strength concrete, I'm going to get a more robust structure, a stiffer structure. That means the lateral load resisting system is going to work better when we use higher strength materials. So you have to keep that also in mind. So on one side, you have to use higher strength materials and optimize the structure. The, that is the vertical load carrying system coupled with horizontal load carrying the horizontal members, which are actually transferred in the vertical loads onto the vertical load carrying system consisting of columns and beams. So steps also can be optimized. Then the moment you optimize these and use high strength concrete in columns and reasonably high strong beams, then you'll find the stiffness of the structure has increased because the stiffness has increased so much. Now you find the behavior of the structure is better. And what we say a good behavior is the, the drift is low, drift is low, the deflections are low, and most importantly, the wind induced accelerations are also wind induced accelerations are also very low. So it's very important to keep in mind concrete is a super material, ideal for tall buildings, but you can make that advantage to maximum effect is only if you have mastered the guidelines given in the Euro code with respect to the gain in strength, the materials, and you have to become a master of the game when it comes to concrete technology. So I'm going to conduct a lecture on concrete technology also one of these days. And uh, if you want, uh, we can have it. Uh, that all. Uh, that's all. That de all depends on your choice. If you want to have a lecture at a later date, we can have it on a later date. But if you think it's important to have have a lecture on concrete technology before we move lot into tall buildings, please put it on the chat box. Based on your requests, we'll see. Uh, we can have a lecture towards the end of. February or early March on concrete technology. So it's all up to you. And uh, just indicate your preferences on the chat box so that we can, uh, we can uh, organize the lectures based on your choice. Because now we are opening up little by little. Because early it was very structured. Now we are opening up and we can accommodate your requests. So we are not touched foundation so far. We not touch foundations immediately, but we'll first cover the tall buildings, a little bit of modeling, a little bit of uh, more understanding. And after that, we'll uh, start covering foundations for smaller buildings. And again, we have to start smaller buildings uh, with isolated footings and then uh, inverted type footings, and then the rough foundations, and finally, five, five foundations. So, so there's a series of lectures, and I'm also planning to bring in 
Dr. Ryan Dizilla to conduct lectures on foundations where he will show you how to make use of the sophisticated foundation design techniques based on limited theory for foundations. And those methods are given in Eurocodes. Eurocode 7 covers the foundations and it's all given in the Eurocode, uh, I think uh, 5 or 6 or uh, one of these codes is uh, on foundations, geotechnical uh, aspects. Uh, Mason is 6, earthquake is 8, uh, foundations is 7. The foundations is Eurocode 7. So look, look into, you know, if you look at those, you find it gives so many different methods of dealing with foundation design. And you can still use the old method where we design the foundations based on serviceable limit state that is also allowed, but it allows more advanced methods. And it has to be taught by a geotechnical engineer, not a structural engineer because uh, my uh, geotechnical engineering knowledge is not sufficient to teach uh, those methods because you have to go deep into the friction angle and cohesion when you are dealing with those methods. So ideal person is uh, Dr. Nairindi Sibla, he agreed. So he'll be taking like, those lectures. So you can see the moment you go into Eurocodes, there's huge amount of interaction and which means you must broaden your knowledge a lot. So we'll try and cover those things in greater detail as the time permits. So you can see foundations are very important. We have to optimize not only uh, the files, the but you have to consider the options like rafts and pile rafts. And what is the difference between a raft and a pile raft? In the pile raft, you will get some friction piles and a raft. So when the system is loaded, the piles will carry some load, raft will carry some load, and raft will ensure the, the, the soil is loaded everywhere. But the beauty is, even if there are weak pockets still, the raft will not tilt. It will retain its shape, and generally in pile rafts, the maximum deflection in the raft foundation occurs in the center. And it will go, you will get a concave type shape with the maximum, def, maximum deformation towards the center of the building. And because of that reason, you'll find the soil is just at the location where, it's, where it has the highest confinement. Because building is confined in the soil, and if you get the highest deformation in the center, then the soil is just highest where it has the highest confinement, which means you are having advantage. That's why they used friction piles in Petronas Tower. The reason is that in, in Thailand, you cannot find bedrock. Even if you drill, 300 meters, you can't find bedrock. So they went up to 125 meters and created a pile raft so that the whole building will settle by, this, by some amount. And piles will settle, the raft will settle, and all that will stress the soil, consolidate the soil, and make the soil better. And then you have a combined system carrying all the loads. So it's a very advanced design. And uh, again, you can do modeling of that type of systems, but the most important thing is how to create that type of systems in Sri Lanka. That type of systems, we have developed a method of make, making use of pile rafts. But for that, you, have, you need laterite soil available in Sri Lanka. So if you have a location high, uh, not, not a low line land, not a, not a land full of peat, it's a good land, you get laterite soil, the bedrock is 20 meters below, but it's laterite soils, then you can consider using pile rafts. On the other hand, you take the piles up to the bedrock, and then 
the question is do we need a raft answer is no there is absolutely no need to have a raft because even if you have a raft it will not be mobilized the reason is all the piles are resting on bedrock the def deformation of piles will be limited to 5 mm 6 mm this and to mobilize the full capacity of a raft you need 50 to 60 mm settlement or even more which means you are not going to get the effect of a raft but in colombo you find there are many buildings having so many piles and having 3 mm thick 3 meter thick raft cast with enormous amount of trouble cast by taking enormous amount of trouble to control the temperature to ensure that delayed ettringite formation will not occur. last time i told you you can download the paper on delayed ettringite formation and all the solutions that you need on uh, the concrete technology by typing mtr dressing d e f and it was authored by indian one senaka vanikaratna and myron myron is uh, now has completed his phd and working in australia and one senaka vanikaratna is the engineer who has designed the tallest building in sri lanka having 77 floors and his design was sent to our partners for checking and they said it's the perfect design so so you can uh, you can always read this paper and we all worked and we should be thankful to maga engineering also because they allowed us to take so many readings in their actual structures and because of that reason we were able to calibrate the software that we use for generating uh, predicting the temperatures and once we calibrated the software we used it to generate all the different situations and then we converted those to a set of charts today you are so lucky within in less than 5 minutes you can select a suitable mix depending on the thickness and for and you have different uh and you can have different basin temperatures and how to do adjustments to all those various factors are all given in that paper so download the paper and read it and you can gain a lot and so how foundations is a critical factor and if you want to know we had fractured rock fractured rock at altea site and the structural engineer i was only the checking engineer structural engineer is a very brave person and he insisted socketing 10 meter into the fractured rock and he knew very well that is not going to move when the geotechnical engineer proposed a capacity of 6500 kilonewtons for a 1.2 meter diameter pile the structural engineer said 11700 kilonewtons is close to double and for 1.5 diameter piles he proposed 11700 and something like 17000 kilometers 17000 kilometers and most of the projects in sri lanka before that we have used only 10000 11000 as the capacity for 1500 diameter ensure that this kind of high capacity is available we used 60 megapascal concrete in pipe 60 megapascal concrete then you will ask what is the cost difference between 30 megapascal concrete and 40 megapascal concrete per meter cube the price difference is only about 1500 rupees it used to be about 1000 rupees now it is it will be about 1500 rupees per meter cube of concrete. So when you are going for 60 megapascal concrete, it may be it may be about 4,000 rupees more expensive than a normal concrete. But if you look at the concrete per cube price today, that is 22,000 kilonewton, excuse me, 22,000 rupees to 23,000 rupees per
per meter cube, it used to be about 18,000 rupees. It has gone up by about 4,000 rupees, 5,000 rupees. And when you compare that, even if you have to use 4,000 rupees more per meter cube, but if you are going to get a much higher load carrying capacity, it's worth considering. It's worth considering going for a high strength pipe. Then again, you'll ask, there are so many restrictions on the British port, but most of those are not available in the Euro. So the moment you go for Euro code, again, you can see, you can stretch the limit. You can stretch the limits. So, what are the structural forms? The structural forms means you will have large, Uh, in, common, in office buildings, you need large free spaces so that you can do use lightweight partitions and do all the partitions. In apartment buildings, you need a lot of partitions. So in apartment buildings, one of the options is above the transfer plate, you, you can have a large number of small concrete walls, thin concrete walls of 225 millimeter thickness or 250 millimeter thickness. And so many walls, which, will, which means you need a transfer plate structure, as I explained last time. On the other hand, there's another option. That option is you see large columns and have a large span, then a large slab. But again, to optimize the slab, you can have second beams and make the slab thinner. And then go for for lightweight partitions. Go for lightweight partitions, partitions of density 700 to 800 kilograms per meter, kilograms per meter cubed. Lighter than water, lighter than water. And ensure the partition wall thicknesses are 100, 100 to 150 millimeters. That is another option. So there are so many different options. So we will not talk too much about those options. Well, I can explain all those different options in a later day, but today we will concentrate more on the lateral load carrying system. And when it comes to apartment and all those buildings, you have different set of requirements. And in office buildings, we like to have all the services below the ceiling. That means the floor to floor height of an office building will be 3.6 meters, whereas we can we need very few services. In a, an apartment building, so the soffit of the slab can be converted to uh, what you call uh, the ceiling. So ceiling is a soffit, which means you might you can easily maintain three to three point one to three point two meter floor to floor height. So you have to always look for different options. And again, now sometimes the beams are thicker than the walls, so. How about a structure where we completely avoid beams? That is the flat steps. Uh, these days we don't do flat steps with reinforced concrete because they are so uneconomical. We do flat steps with pre-stress concrete. And there are so many buildings in Sri Lanka having all floors pre-stressed. And there's one hotel in Kandy about uh, 18 or 20 floors. All the floors are uh, out of pre-stress, uh, designed by the engineer called Anurad Silva. He's a very experienced engineer having, uh, he has designed some 74 story tall building as well. But not in Sri Lanka, but in Dubai. So he's, uh, he's one of the, uh, he's now doing a PhD with me and he, we are looking at how to go for the buildings having more than 150 floors. So that is the kind of work we are doing. And then, uh, then if you look at Columbus city center, all the floors are pre-stress concrete. And Altea, all the floors are pre-stress concrete. So that you can avoid beams. And also the main advantage of pre-stress concrete is 
because you are using tendons to carry the loads, the curved parabolic tendons and straight tendons to carry the loads, when you, whenever you have a concentration of loads, you can always use additional tendons and carry those extra loads to the supports or to the columns. So there are so many advantages of pre-stressed concrete straps. So that's another option you have to take into account. And Eurocode is again strong in this area. So you can actually make use of the code provisions. Uh, but in pre-stressed concrete design, we can do designs a lot. A lot of design work can be done by using fundamentals the moment you have the basic guidelines. So uh, there are so many options or so many areas. Now you can see um, today, today only we are talking about tall buildings. So many things can be opened up that may not be very important in low rise and medium rise. One is on concrete technology, other one is on slabs, other one is using uh, systems other than reinforced concrete like PT and uh, precast beam slash systems. And also I sh showed you why high strength concrete can be so important when it comes to tall buildings because stiffness can be increased by using high strength concrete. So there are so many different structures that we can use, base frame structures, that's, but that is steel structures, Rigid frame structures, that is the beam column structures, again, ideal for concrete. Infield frame structures, those are the structures where the masonry is used as an infield material. Shear wall structures, the most common structural form. We like shear wall structures a lot because shear walls can stabilize the structures a lot. And then couple shear wall structures, when that is a very useful system you can nearly double the length of a shear wall the moment you combine two shear walls aligned. So you can improve the system, the behavior a lot, upper shear wall structures, but these, these are more vulnerable for earthquake damage. So we have to do proper earthquake designs for these couple shear wall structures. Wall frame structures, that is the interaction between strong walls and strong frames. So you'll make the frame strong, wall strong, then you'll find you get a strong interaction between these two and the behavior of the building is not a cantilever mode, not the shear mode, but it's a combination of cantilever and shear where the cantilever mode dominates at the bottom where the deformation is zero, the rotation is zero. And in the top, the building bends back and that is due to shear mode and then you will find overall deformation of the structure can be much less than the deflection that is given by a can that is given by a structure behaving in cantilever. So you can see by combining the strength of the frame and the wall, we can go for something like 780 story buildings. And then frame tube structures. This is one of the very important innovations by uh, an Indian engineer called Fritz Khan. He actually, uh, he was born in the area that we call Bangladesh today, but he was born in 1920s. Those days, it was all one India. There was no Pakistan, no, no Bangladesh. It was only one country and it was India. He was born in India, but actually he, he is from the area what you call Bengal, uh, the Bangladesh, where the people speak Bengali, which is a language very, very similar to the Sinhala that we speak here. And their habits are also very similar. They also, they don't eat, their food habits are very different. They don't eat uh, the normal food, the Indian food. They eat rice and curry. And they talk like us. And they are all very nice, kind-hearted people. So this engineer was born there. Then he, he went to America as a Fulbright scholar. Then he moved on to tall building sector. Then he did a very important innovation. His innovation is based on a biological structure that is the bamboo. He thought 
Bamboo is very strong, but it has no core. So if we have a building which is very strong on the outer skin, then we can have a structure that is behaving like a bamboo, very strong. Bamboos are very strong, but there's no core. So he looked at it, he developed this concept, tube, tubular structures, frame tube structures. And then people went further and they, they developed two tubes rather than one tube. Then they went even further, they started combining four tubes or nine tubes together. And if you look at CS Tower, it's, it's a nine tube structure. It has nine tubes. And CS Tower was one of the tallest buildings and it dominated the skyline for a long period of time. And they said, CS Tower has the, has the office, has an office at the highest level. CS Tower is having an office in the 103rd floor. And they said, CS Tower has an office at the highest level. Because Petronas, all the other buildings, they are talking with the, all the other gadgets, but not a habitable floor. But CS Tower had a big problem. Similarly, World Trade Center also had a big problem. What is that big problem? If you have a restaurant at the top of uh, top of CS Tower, and if you have a wine glass, you'll see the liquid in the wine is shaking. What is the reason? Bill is moving and it's moving too much. And because it's moving too much, you can feel the acceleration. But nevertheless, they use that building. And then you'll ask again, why they constructed such a tall building? Well, they wanted two buildings, they later they found. Because this Khan is involved, he said, let's combine nine bamboo and create a strong, super strong bamboo. Same way they, they, they combined nine tubes and created a very tall, elegant structure, which you need a very small quantity of steel, very efficient structure, very economical structure. So they went for that, model tubes, brace tube structures, and in addition to tube, you get bracings, outrigger brace structures, that is, you know, combined in the outer skin and the inner columns by using large internal beams and then you will make it even more stronger by running a beam, deep beam on the outer periphery of the structure. Then you call it uh, uh, outrigger brace structures. You get outriggers and then belt trusses. Then you get uh, some structures where the, when the architects say, I don't want any columns on the outer periphery. There's no option, no other option. Only option is hang the structure from top. Then these days you can see they are getting very odd shaped structures in, in the Middle East. They don't know what to do with their money. So they are structural engineers, architects and, architects and structural engineers to come up with very unusual structures. To me, although they, are, they look nice, they are challenging, but that should not be our target. We can have few of them. But all our future structures should not be like that. They should have very simple structure, very efficient structural forms, and then a minimum quantity of material. One good example is Altair, the currently tallest building having 68 floors in Sri Lanka. And we should be proud that we are having such very nice buildings in our small country. And then in the, in in Altair, we have used a very stru efficient structural form. We call it a space structure, and that is called diagrid, diagrid diagonal grid. And diagrid, the advantage is you can, you can have a normal structure like Altair. On the other hand, it's also possible to have a very complicated structure. Again, you'll use the same concept that is three-dimensional 
structures. So three-dimensional structures, there are advanced computer programs that can deal with the geometric modeling and so on, but still you will get a very complicated structure. The, the construction of those will be very challenging, but people are mastering. And then hybrid structures. And that is part of the structures like diagram, another part is frame, combine everything, then you end up with a completely new form. So we are going to talk about all these different things. And before I start talking about those, I would like to ask any questions that you have. Uh, Engineer Kamala, how about questions? Are they the yeah, yeah. yeah, they are. I will read one by one. Uh, in case yeah. continuous slab design, is it required the moment distribution and interior support without using maximum sagging moment derived from coefficients? No, actually, uh, you don't do anything sp very special moment redistribution. If the moments do not match, they, they, it is recommended to adjust the moments. It's, it's not a moment distribution because if you have two slabs, adjacent slabs, which are having different spans, then you are not going to get the same support moment. But you can't have two different support moments because that, go, that is going to rotate the beam. So what you do is you will adjust the support moment sufficiently so that uh, you know the, the, the rotation of the beam can be made almost here. So that is the answer. Uh, so basically, uh, don't do any special moment redistribution uh, because already all those different aspects are taken into account when uh, E-line theory was used to derive those coefficients given in various handbooks and codes. So basically, uh, design manuals, you can find different co coefficients, but they are all similar. But uh, if the sizes of the steps are different, then you will end up with all these additional problems. So that's why in uh, tall buildings, generally we try to try not to do things that we'll do in a two-story house. The two-story house, you can make it as complicated as possible, still it's, it, you can decide. But when, if, you, if you go, if the architect goes in the same kind of mindset and start designing a tall building, then we ask him for trouble because in a tall building, the what, is, what belongs to the architect is the facade, not the structure. Structure belongs to structural engineer because only the structural engineer can come up with economical solutions. And then he will say, okay, now this is my structural form. You can do anything you like with the facade. Whatever you do, I'll accommodate. But, and also feel free to do whatever you like for the facade, but don't touch the structure because structure I have got it right and I don't want anybody changing the structure because I it is my responsibility to make the structure as economical as possible only the structural engineer can do that and but you're free to do whatever you want with the facade because people see only the facade not the structure so that's the way you look at it and any structure that is initiated by the structural engineer, you'll find the structure is very efficient. On the other hand, you join the team of architects at a later stage and the structural engineer. Now, most of the building has already been planned. You do not have much uh, control because everybody else is already into the project. So you can't go and say, I don't like this structure, optimize it. You can't do it. So you have to fit a structure to the existing building. That is, it is very difficult and not economical as well. But very often that happens. But the knowledgeable architects, like uh, the person who did the architectural design of Altea, <laughs> the architect Safdi from, uh, USA, born in Israel, and he's a very good architect. He has designed top buildings in Middle East and also Singapore. And in Singapore, there are three buildings where the all three buildings are connected uh, at the roof level 
at the Marina Bay, and that building was designed by this particular architect. And he has a superb structural engineer called Preda Guerra, and I'm I'm sure you would have heard about heard his lectures. He's a very good structural engineer. He has vast knowledge. One of the top structural engineers in the world, and he he works closely with this architect. So it's a very good combination of architect and engineer. So they they both talk and come up with good solutions. And one of the those is uh, Altair. And then we have uh, this Singapore building, again, a superb structural form. So, so sometimes if you have an architect who is friendly with you, and if he appreciates it, that it's important to have uh, the structural input right at the beginning, then you are lucky, you can end up with the Superb building. Then what is the next question? Excuse yeah, me. What about, How what about the data? Yeah, from the data few more questions. What about yeah. the shear failure of flat slabs? Yeah, flat slabs uh, can fail in shear, but uh, you know you can have uh, steel members like eye girders at the shear, at the column so that the shear failure of the flat slab can be prevented. So there are proprietary systems you can use them. Shear failure of a slab is a problem, but it can be avoided. Uh, with a special, not reinforcement based, but uh, steel member based. Fabric and diaphragm for lateral load shouldn't consider this factor in reducing slab thickness. Not a problem. The moment you have anything more than 75 millimeters, the diaphragm action will be there. Don't worry. Anything more than 75 millimeters, you cannot deform the slab on its own plane. So diaphragm action will be there. No, don't worry. You can reduce the slab thickness as much as possible, but always keep in mind sound insulation is also important. If you have very thin slab, sound insulation will not be there. People in the low floor will always complain. They can't concentrate in their office work because all these people are making dragging the dragging the uh, teapot, dragging the tables and chairs and making so much noise. So because of that reason, sound insulation of a slab must be given a top priority. And you must consider that factor when you are selecting the slab thickness, especially in the optimized forms. So one of the options is you will optimize the slab, save a lot of money, and use a little bit of that money to have a ceiling. Use a little bit of that money to have a ceiling, good ceiling, sound insulated ceiling, little more money, then your problem can be solved. So you optimize the slab, save a lot of money, use that for C. In slab acting diaphragms here. That's what is the next question? Is it recommended to over design the roof slab of high rise building to improve the overall lateral resistance and reduce overall deflection? It will not. There's no way you can control the deflection of a building by designing the roof slab. It's, it's a wrong concept. Uh, could you please add one more lecture for introducing design the composite building, which enables simultaneous construction of above ground floors and basements? No, that is a top-down construction. It is not. Uh, it is not composite building. It is the top-down construction. But there is a system called composite buildings, and the best expert in Sri Lanka is Dr. Pradeep from Open University, uh, Pradeep Tantirike from Open University. He is very good with uh, the deck-based designs, composite designs. So I have invited him to uh, come and do a few lectures. He's the expert in Sri Lanka for this type of construction. So Mr. Seneca also knows uh, Dr. Pradeep is, uh, uses it a lot. So I have invited Dr. Pradeep to do a lecture, but the most important thing is when you are buying the steel decking material, it's very important you buy a proprietary product and uh, some best products would be something like the Blue Scope, which is a very old, well, well known name. Uh, don't go with uh, cheap products when you are using deck material. Deck material has a thickness of 0.7 millimeter. 
We are doing using deck material as reinforcement. You must use a properly constructed, com manufactured deck material with sufficient color corrosion control. Otherwise, you will find huge amount of problems. And if you go to our ISL on building, steel building is already showing signs of corrosion, which is not a good indicator. Always you have to keep in mind, any deck material that you use out of steel must be out of the best steel with most best protected steel so that it's not going to corrode. Because corrosion of a slab in a tall building is a disaster. So you have to be very careful in uh, using all the different systems. Uh, then what is the next one? Could it be said? It's a request. It's a request. A request. Yeah. So uh, uh, Dr. Pradeep, Dr. Pradeep from Open University will come. He's a graduate from Luna University and he's supervisor for undergraduate workers, Dr. Sujivale on Kamake. He's, uh, he has done uh, his PhD in Rome and he's a real expert on dynamics. So you can contact either Dr. Suji Olevan Kamake or his student at Rune, uh, Dr. Pradeep for any dynamic related matter, or you can also contact Dr. Kushan Vijay Sundar for any dynamic related matter. So there are three experts in Sri Lanka for dynamics, Dr. Suji Olevan Kamake from, uh, he's not doctor now, he's Professor Suji Olevan Kamake from Moroto University or Dr. Kushan Vijay Sundar from Peragan University or Dr. Pradeep Tantirike from Open University. So there are three, three people, we are lucky. We are having a lot of people who can do uh, all this. And then, uh, so can you explain about wind tunnel testing in upcoming lectures? Yes, I will get one of the key experts this is ranked, he's within the top 10 experts on wind engineering. He's Dr. Asiri Virasuria. He's from uh, uh, Hong Kong University and we'll get him to do a lecture. And then we'll also get Professor Sujiva Levan Kamage to do a lecture on wind, wind for Sri Lanka. Because he has developed the wind map for Sri Lanka, which has been adopted. And we are again now planning to do slight modifications for this map so that it will look like the map that we have used with CP3 chapter five part, but not the same. We'll have slightly similar features because the map that Dr. Sujiva developed with one of the lecturers at ITUM, University of Morato, he did his MPhil with Dr. Sujiva or Professor Sujiva. And that map is based on the available data. So in the areas when data is not, is not available, then, then the results may be for a lower wind speed. So once you develop the map, you need some modifications. And now we are in the process of doing those modifications. It will appear as a research paper on engineer journal. And that will be the final wind map for Sri Lanka. It will come up, in, come up shortly. So in the meantime, you can make use of the wind map that has already been adopted for uh, Eurocode. And the moment the new map comes becomes available, we'll, we'll, we'll get Sri Lanka Standards Institute to add the latest wind map to the National NHA for wind load. So I think I have, uh, uh, answer most of the, okay, if building is supported on NBRing uh, piles to PT soils, upper layers, how do we transfer the lateral loads to the ground? Yes, you have to, you have to consider it like a table. You have one, one, one leg, not stable, but a table is very stable. So you create steps and have a thick uh, beam based connection for all the pile caps. If the pile cap is 1.5 meter deep, you will have a connecting beam of another 1.5 meter. The moment you have a connecting beam of 1.5 meter, then it's like a table. And you know, there are so many piles, maybe 100 piles connected everywhere. It's like a table. So the moment you socket more, if the, if 
the peat if there's peat soil you will suck it at least 2.5 to 3 meters into the bedrock the reason is you want per, almost perfect anchoring of the pile into the bedrock so that you have fixed end condition at the bottom and you can make a fixed end condition at the top the moment you make fixed ends at the bottom and top of the pile the deformation of the pile will be in double curvature bending and because of that reason you will find the the deflection of the structure can be controlled very well and the other important thing is although you think peat is very weak most of the peat available in sri lanka would not be that weak we are not talking about malaysia malaysia has very weak peat, peat conditions and so one area is all peat but it's ground and if the peat is not there there's no can't so so there are areas with so weak conditions but in sri lanka we are lucky here most of our peat conditions are not as bad as most of the other countries so because of that reason most of our peat layers can be limited to about 6 meters very few places like orugodawath you get 8 uh, 10 to 12 meters of peat so basically you don't have to worry too much the if you have peat peat soils make sure you anchor it at the bottom anchor it at the top with a beam system the moment you do that rotations will become minimum the piles will bend in double curvature bending because of that reason you need full length reinforcement whereas in altea we use one length reinforcement that is only one length of 12 meters because the structure engineer is so confident there's no need to there's no need to use any reinforcement below 12 meters because nothing is going to move this building so don't waste reinforcement just by putting it down to the bottom of it bottom of it so basically we have answered most of the questions so we look at uh, what is the time now now it's a uh, it's professor there is one direct question to me shall i read it a small one yeah when we are planning to use pre stress slab how to plan the arrangement of columns so generally i mean pre stress uh, slab means uh, they are very efficient only when the only when uh, the spans are like 8 uh, eight, eight to 10 meters they are very efficient because you know you have to use a minimum thickness of about uh, 180 to 200 mm generally you don't go for a thickness less than that so when when you use uh, 200 then it, you know when you increase the uh, span to about uh, 8 meters 9 meters you need only 220 The advantage of using 220 is the service engineers will ask for drops. If you have 220 service, you give to service engineer, you will be a little strict with the service engineer. You might give 125 or 150 drop. Still, 70 millimeters is available, and that 70 millimeters is sufficient to have two mats of 8 millimeter bars. The moment you do that, you create the washroom drop. within the slab and if you can control the width of that 1.5 meters very good because the maximum space in between two adjacent strands is 1.5 meters so if you can confine the washroom drop with careful planning to be less than 1.5 meters the slab does not know there's a drop the slab does not know that there's a drop so so basically uh, you will go for not 6.5 meters or 6 meters spans you will go for 8 to 10 meters spans knowing very well the use of 225 to 230 millimeters slab will allow you to have all the washroom drops within the slab how i answer the question yeah uh, professor yeah is, uh, what is the time now 8:40. We we can wind up actually. Yeah, 8:40. Yeah. Yeah. So so next day we'll look into the each and every structural form. But today I gave some introduction to the tall buildings. 
specially covering why we should be masters of the game when it comes to uh, euro codes because euro codes allow us to do be very adventurous as structural engineering not like british codes british codes are very good they are excellent but they guide you and because they guide you a lot your scopes are restricted whereas euro code does not guide you it tell you it asks you to use your brain and do something so you can have enormous varieties of beliefs when you go for euro codes but to become familiar with euro codes you must start reading the codes books like musti and banji maginli and i think uh, Alan's book is also coming with uh, four euro codes. It might come shortly, and uh, then uh, then even if it is written for the old code, read the book by Kong and Evans. Kong and Evans is not is not it's for the British code. It's worth reading it because it will tell you a lot of fundamental things that is very useful. Just read it. Don't spend a lot of time, but just read it. and then there are so many other new books written for the euro code and in euro codes you can again see uh, there are uh, uh, even in the beam it, it gives you b zones d zones all kinds of things and d zone is a place where b zone is a place where the plane sections remain plane d plane d zone is a place where the plane sections do not remain plane. all these different variations can occur in a beam so there are so many advanced stuff included in the euro codes and make sure that you have read about all those things that and as a result you feel very confident that you will not you know a lot about euro codes and you have using euro code is not a challenge for you and by using euro codes you are willing to take huge challenges by stretching it to the stretching the materials to the limit and structural capabilities to the limit so what is the question uh, yeah that's all kamala yeah yeah it, that's all the question but uh, there is a small request can you yeah. explain about wind tunnel test in upcoming lectures it's a request so with that yeah, yeah. Wind, wind, wind tunnel i'll get dr asiri uh, dr asiri veer uh, surya is a real master yeah, of the yeah. and in addition to that in addition to that the good news is we are we are plan, trying our best to get a large wind tunnel in sri lanka funded by an adb funded project having a value of 30000 million rupees which is actually uh, under professor sujeev levan kam guys he is the director of the project and uh, we have submitted a proposal for a large wind tunnel to be to be installed at sri jawadharpur university so that all of you will be able to see how the wind tunnels work if the project goes through. and it will be something like uh, 80 to 100 million rupee investment and uh, if it all happens we'll be very lucky and similarly we are also working on a shaking table shake table and that shake table our vice chancellor has agreed to fund it if we are going to manufacture the shake table in sri lanka without importing it and we said we are going to do it so now we are we have started that so with those two pieces of equipment in one of the universities in sri lanka you will be able to do a lot of experiments and it will be very useful for many engineers so so basically wind tunnel will not be you uh, are going for wind tunnels in sri lanka as well and and the instrumentation cost alone is about 50 million rupees that is just the instrumentation not the wind tunnel but uh, so all or or all it can be anything in the range of 80 to 100 billion so have i answered the question yeah from yeah we can wind up so shall i call engineer 
Srivaritan to deliver your the yeah, vote. Yeah, and also I have a note uh, on this. Uh, I can share that note with you. So uh, basically, uh, if I shall I send it to you, Engineer Kamala, so that you can make some arrangements with Engineer Manjula to uh, get the email addresses and form an email group so that whenever we want uh, to we, email we will, some, yeah. some yeah. yeah, yeah, we will ask ISL to dispatch like this webinar. We can ask them to put the email to everyone. Yes, that can yes. be done. So after the lecture, I'll send it to you. Uh, yeah. with the with the powerpoint with powerpoint also i will give a copy of the powerpoint presentation then you can uh, share it uh, with all and if you can make it some kind of downloadable material with links then uh, then all the participants will be able to uh, you don't have to send the presentation you will send only the link and they can download yes and i think it's, it's ideal if you can form an e email email group uh, so that uh, you know, uh, we'll be able to share a lot of materials in future as well. Okay. Okay. Then I'll uh, I'll stop here. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so as usual, I'm uh, taking this opportunity to uh, deliver the vote of thanks. First of all, as usual, uh, the professor uh, Jai Singh. Uh, in many years, uh, I. I I'm known to him and also uh, so this lecture was very useful, very informative and uh, the structural forms you explain a lot uh, and a lot of um, uh, fac factors, a lot of things you have explained is very useful actually. And also there were uh, many things that I also couldn't remember that I uh, pick uh, many points. So uh, it's very uh, um, the uh, privilege to thank uh, the, uh, at this forum and uh, so you are giving uh, you are sharing your uh, knowledge with us thank you very much uh, and uh, so i hope that, that we will uh, um, we'll follow more lectures in the future and also uh, thank you for the isl uh, hosting this uh, event and also the it team and also the organizing uh, team of uh, this uh, lecture series and uh, finally the all the participants who participated in this lecture and without you actually we can't make this uh, lecture series success thank you all and uh, have a good evening good night uh, thank you so we'll see uh, in another lecture next time next next week thank you very thank much thank you thank yeah. you